So uh, welcome back, John and Brashan, to Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero, where we apply the ideas of Ayn Rand into our practical life so that we can live a life of heroic meaning, where we can actually create true, lasting, objective happiness for ourselves and those we care about. And this is a continuation of our extended conversation uh, last week on meta-ethics. And what we want to do this time, we were thinking as we create this, because we don't really know what we're going to say, right? John, John and Brashan and I haven't worked all of this out, but we know what we want to talk about. It'll be interesting to find out how, what they have to say, what I have to say, how it comes together. But what we wanted to talk about is where does the rubber meet the road on this? What's the cash value in this idea of meta-ethics and the idea that the ego is actually an organism that has its own life, our, that we have a psychological life which can live or die, that we can build an ethics around our psychology, not just our body, not just our rationality, et cetera. What does that mean and how does it all come together? So, so welcome, John and Brashan, and uh, we'll dive in. You guys ready? Thanks. Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So, so one of the things we were thinking is we can talk about some of the key ideas that we came to at the end, uh, at the end or during our last conversation. There's a lot of places where we could double click and go deep into what we were doing. And, and one of the ideas is, okay, if you understand that the ego is an organism and that the stuff that the ego uses to build itself is narrative. It's the stories that we tell. And those stories can be objective. They can be wholesome. They can be rational. Right? Or they can be problematic and violate metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics, aesthetics. That you can be wrong on any of those or all of them in your story, in your narrative. And how you build the narrative is the self that you're building and it lives. So how does this actually apply? What are some real world everyday kinds of concerns that we deal with? And how does this framework offer guidance in that? So with that big picture, right, where, where do you want to take it, John Brashan? As you were speaking, I was thinking of the felt experience of my conscience, like right now. How do I feel? And what's the experience of being an organism? And I can relate that, abs relate that concrete experience to the ideas we talked about of being an organism, like energy. Like, how does my energy level of this organism, where is it right now? Do I feel, like, energetic, filled with uh, fuel, or am I running low? And I could sense, like, oh, okay, I'm in, a, like, a, a 5 out of 10, let's say. I'm in the middle range of energy. And how uh, how is this organism, how am I protecting myself? Do I feel in the need of self-protection, for example. This is a common thing living things do, is pr protect themselves, that's part of life. Or repair, how am I doing with resilience and repairing damage when I can't protect myself? And how am I relating to you right now? Each of those is a specific need of the self, this ego as organism. And I just wanted to draw my attention to that felt experience and notice what what it is and kind of bring bring some mindfulness to that experience and curious and, and also to our relationship how are we together how what is it like being this or organism and how would you conceptualize your experience in terms of, in organismic terms? Mm -hmm. Well, so, so this, this brings up an idea that, that we came to in our last conversation, which is that when you are 
interacting with the world, when the stories that you're telling, when the the way that you understand who you are, who the world is, who the other person is, and how you're interacting together, when those stories are coherent and congruent and uh, mesh well objectively with the actual needs of your organism, the actual needs of life, that when those pieces are going well, when you are re, uh, maintaining yourself, protecting yourself, when you are transcending yourself and growing, when you are uh, reproducing yourself through being able to see yourself live in others through mutual understanding and by building relationships. Like when, when those things are going well in terms of the natural growth of the organism, we experience happiness. Mm -hmm. That there's an experiential readout that lets us know how is our organism doing in terms of how it's metabolizing its environment, how it's metabolizing its experience, the kind of stories we're telling. And so when I heard you say, oh, I'm checking in with my energy levels, how alive and vibrant I am, right? It's kind of like, oh, well, let me check the readout. Let me check the actual experience so that I can use that as a kind of diagnostic tool to look at, are my stories in place? Am I maintaining myself, transcending myself, reproducing myself appropriately? Does that fit what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I like that you bring up transcending, Mark, because this stuff, if you if you say, from what we said last time, I felt like um, it still ended up in subjective personal values, because, which is not where I'm headed. I, everybody's on to that, that just stuck on that, really. And what I want, what I'm interested in, have always been for 35 years, is, is objective personal, not universal, personal values. And when you said transcendence, I'm taking that to mean change, and I'm connecting that to what Rand talks about when she says the best within us. And so it's not enough to simply replicate what we are, um, maintain what we are, um, and defend what we are. We also need to validate our standards, virtues, and values, because those are the constraints on our psychological self. So if you look at our psychological self as an organism, it has certain constraints, and those constraints are basically its standards, virtues, and values. And so simply taking whatever standards, virtues, and values we have and acting like that's just the given with no validation process would be as akin in logic or uh, reasoning to simply throwing out any premise or any argument and not validating it. So the crux of happiness, the morality in my view, ethics, is all about validation, objective validation. And nobody in objectivism has ever gone off on how do you objectively validate personal values to get them so that such that they make you happier. And that whole idea of transcendence, which is change, which is growth, etc., that's really the crux, because otherwise it's still hedonism. If you simply take what you are and you defend, promote, replicate that, it, you haven't validated it. So you're not into objectivity yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so, so it's interesting. As, as you say that, you use the word validate, mm -hmm. right, in the context of growth, transcendence, mm -hmm. becoming, kind of mm -hmm. fulfilling your potential. Right, right. And, 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 and uh, when I tend to think of validation, I tend to think of it's like, okay, there's the way that it is, and you are saying the way that it is is good. But it, you're using it in an interesting, from, from my perspective, an interesting way that validating actually creates the space for growth. Yes, it produces the growth, actually, because well, it's just, uh, it's just, it's all about contradiction resolution or bringing th or conflict resolution if the, if the problem is manifesting, let's say, with another, or it could be conflict resolution with inside yourself if you have two different standards that are competing for primacy inside your value hierarchy or whatever. It's Yeah, it's to be objective is to validate, and, and you need to validate on personal values as well as in logic and reason and all of that. I want to relate objectivity to this, bring objectivity into self-protection, self-development, uh, 
relationship development and validation. So um, and one of the things that you mentioned was contradictions and one of the ways that we experience contradiction is uh, anxiety. Rand talked about the squirms when she would write as caused, being caused by contradictory orders in her subconscious, standing orders that says contradictory things and she can't fulfill them all. So she feels this anxiety and people feel anxiety in real life because they have contradictory standards that they can't actually achieve. And that goes to non-objectivity. It's sort of the solution then being to, to bring to light, bring to awareness what the contradictions are, and then make some resolution. Say, well, what really is more important than this? Am I, try I, I can't achieve the impossible, so let me resolve this. Um, let me consciously and ultimately put it in a story and, and see if that resonates with you. How what are my internal contradictions that are maybe in my shadow side and I'm going to bring them to light, put them uh, objectively in a story and consciously resolve them and then see how it, see how I feel inside. And I sus suspect that it's transformational. It makes, it makes you actually feel better. And I've experienced that and I'm sure you have as well. Yeah, perhaps. You, you don't have to put it in a story. You can do it more consciously, but it's the ultimate form if if it's res if it's hard to it's resolve it mentally or 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 I think stories are like this the 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 big power tool of of self development the earth move real power you know you really and because even when you do part of a story you, even when you don't consciously do a full story I think you may be completing implicit stories by even naming how you're feeling filling in gaps and stories that maybe are incomplete. i mean coming coming to terms with your experience yeah. that at at different levels you can look at language and language is you could say largely metaphorical even when i say that it's largely mm -hmm. metaphorical that's a metaphor yeah and when i say that it's metaphorical that's a metaphor right, right? you could even say when i say that it is Right. What is an it in this case? We're referring to something as if it's a thing, but really it's an idea. It's a concept. Right. So there, there are levels of metaphor, levels of stories that happen when we come to terms with things. Um, so I'll, I'll say two things to build on what you just said. And then I want I know Brashan has some uh, kind of a story about Reardon that I think we could that we can use to bring in as a you could say a case study around which we can build. So the, I, I, I sometimes think that when we shift from the idea that our self is a body, right, or our self is a body with a mind, right, to you no, know, our self is actually its own organism that's built on the foundation, the substrate of the body and the mind, but then we've got this self that if the self had a body, that body is made up of stories. That you could say that stories are the flesh of the self. Mm. And so when you're, when you're making choices, like mm. you could say that you have a self right now, which is in uh, relative states of disarray. <laughs> in other words, all of the various stories that make up yourself, all mm. of the values that you have are not completely worked out. That there are, in fact, a lot of values which work against each other, as you were saying with Ayn Rand, that she's got these multiple standing orders which are in conflict mm -hmm. and that cause her to feel anxiety, squirm, like, I, I want to do this and I want to do this. I need to do this and I need to do this. And they're in conflict. There's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, in reality, contradictions don't exist. Well, in the values, the contradictions are in the values. Yes, the contradictions are are in the values. They also might be in they also might be in the epistemology. They might be in our understanding of like is light a particle or a wave. There's a lot of you could say there's a lot of levels to have contradictions. But in this case, contradictions and values. Yes, right? is not well understood in objectivism. Yes, and 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 I'd say in life in general. So what, while I want to keep this within the context of objectivism, it is the Becoming an Unran Hero podcast, it's, it's more about how do we apply this, this, especially in this one, how do we apply this in our real life? 
So we've got these multiple values, which seem to be in contradiction with one another, mostly because the stories are unintegrated. We have two stories which are coming and they're clashing with one another. And so in that we experience some anxiety, some squirm. Um, I'm fond of saying in my work that problems are the solution. That problems are the solution. That when you set goals, like, oh, I wanna do this and I wanna do this, that sometimes you come up with obstacles. Uh -huh. That's what happens when you set goals. That in fact, without goals, there are no obstacles. <laughs> there are only obstacles when you want to do something, uh -huh. right? And once you create the goal, you create obstacles. And those obstacles tell you where your stories are inconsistent with the reality of the world, with the reality of yourself, the reality of your own development. Like the contradiction focuses your attention and you feel the contradiction and it brings it up in your awareness so you can deal with it. I say, I say in relationships that if we're, you and I are in relationship and, and I say, so what are your boundaries in relationship? And I go, well, it's kind of like this and like this and uh, don't lie and don't cheat. And, uh, but uh, it's kind of hard to state. But when someone crosses one of your boundaries, you know exactly where the boundary is. You know exactly what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And like, like when the conflict comes into existence, the, your consciousness gets drawn to the contradiction between your values, between the incompatibilities of your values. And in that point, that allows you to transcend yourself, to take the self that you are right now with its relative constraints and as those constraints work with one another to to work it out rationally through stories and to find a higher level solution that can integrate both of the lower stories and that higher level solution is a type of transcendence it's a type of growth it's, it's a higher level process that integrates the lower level values. It says, ah, oh, yes, we want this and we want this. We can let go of this. We can let go of this. And we come, when we come to terms with that higher level value, when we put it into a story or a, or a logical formulation, we have created another part of ourself, our flesh. The self that we are has actually grown. We have transcended ourselves into a higher form, something that, in, that is more integrated than it was before. Mm -hmm. Another right. way of talking about this in connection with stories, um, we really like Peacock's formulation in his Eight Great Plays course, where he says that the theme of a story is the primacy of A over B. And John added, in context C, to achieve value D. And mm -hmm. just hold story and theme, specifically the theme of a story, as a sort of almost like a mathematical formulation of a statement of a value hierarchy. hierarchy. Then you can see that you could, a person could implicitly, without realizing it, have multiple of these sort of thematic statements of value hierarchies, um, I'll concretize with Reardon in a second, um, that are conflicting with each other. And that is what leads to this anxiety or stress or conflict with others, et cetera. And so to concretize, so Reardon, uh, through his personal development through Atlas Shrugged, he starts off with this sort of simplistic approach to contract, uh, contracts uh, uh, where if you've made a contract with someone your word is your bond and it's almost like an intrinsicism and through the story he's able to get more contextual and realize that um, when even if you've made a contract with someone who's out to get you like Lillian was trying to destroy himself you don't honor that right you're more contextual once you realize when you have incoming information he didn't realize when he married her that if he had, he would never have married her, but he didn't realize she's trying to destroy himself. And so he gets more contextual about things. So that's so to put it in this mathematical formula, you might say Reardon started off with the primacy of honoring contracts over not honoring contracts. That's his story that he's telling. Okay, mm -hmm. value hierarchy in a sort of an abstract statement. And by the end of Alice, he switched it or changed it or modified it to the primacy of upholding your contracts when you're dealing with people who want to support yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so on the, on the one hand, he's got this story 
this primacy of A over B in con uh, to achieve C in context D. Yeah. Right. He, he's got this story, which is I honor my contracts. Right. Right. And because of that, he that the power that he has in that story, mm -hmm. the baby in that story mm -hmm. is that it allows him to build tremendous relationships and also make agreements with himself about what he's going to accomplish. So he accomplishes a lot. Right. But then there's another story, which is that he falls in love with Dagny and Dagny makes him happy. And Dagny wants his growth. Dagny is in support of his self and soul. Happy. And these two stories come together and clash. Mm -hmm. And in the process of resolving that, in the process of, you know, a lot of conversations with Francisco, uh, m mainly, <laughs> right? But through this process, he comes to a higher level synthesis, right? This is, you could say, you know, uh, premise antagonism synthesis or uh, in, in kind of a Hegelian mm -hmm. methodology. It's like you've got these pieces that come together and you find their limitations in both of them. Mm -hmm. And then he finds a higher level synthesis mm -hmm. where, where he recognizes, ah, the purpose of an agreement mm -hmm. is the growth. I got into the agreement for a purpose. Mm -hmm. There's the spirit Mm -hmm. underneath this letter of the law right mm -hmm. right and and he and in the process he differentiated i'll say the baby is that you honor your agreements right, right? but the bathwater is that what if the agreement isn't what you thought it was or with who you thought it was with yes what? yes he thought that the agreement was that he and lillian were going to support each other and living great lives right but it turns out that that wasn't her understanding. So he's now, on the one hand, he needs to honor the agreement. On the other hand, the agreement isn't what he thought it was. Right. How does he deal with that? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and again, bring this back, this led him to a tremendous inner conflict, a squirm, mm -hmm. tremendous anxiety about who he was. And he was questioning his own morality. He was questioning his, like, what am I doing breaking a contract this is not me this yeah. is wrong but at the same time there's something about what i have with dagny which is so right right that it it's having me question my previous self right. i had a previous self right. and now i'm having an experience that leads me to this squirm which has me both feel tremendous conflict and a tremendous sense of energy aliveness goodness value and and so with, with, with that, I want to say one more thing and then turn it over. You started this by, ah, well, if we're going to look at how does this apply in our actual life, let's look at our actual energy level in the moment. Now, energy is an interesting metaphor, right? What does it mean to have energy or different kinds of energy or an amount of energy? Well, in the context of self as organism, we might say that there is an energy that maintains the organization, organism, that replicates the organ, organism, and that grows or transcends the organism that has it built. And that energy is a confluence or a congruence between the constraints such that the system is purring. It's kind of like an engine where all the pieces are going together that generates, let's call it this energy. Mm -hmm. Myself, I experience that energy of of life of transcendence of the recognition that there is a next level self that i can achieve if only i move towards it uh -huh. right i experience that energy i i experience that as enlivenment as joy as hope as anticipation as excitement as possibility uh -huh. right there's that energy and phenomenologically it's like oh yes there's a possibility here i get excited i lean in my attention focuses other things become less important i want to pursue this beautiful thing right so if we use reardon as an example we might make it more personal into things that we're doing ourselves but how does this idea of ego as organism, self as organism, 
How does it help us actually navigate that kind of value choice, that kind of in, internal value conflict or uncertainty about which way to go when you've got multiple ways to go, kind of like it is the case in every situation all the time, like this moment by moment experience of human choice. Mm -hmm. I, I leave it to you, sir. There is a uh, way you could exp you could you could say there's a baseline feeling state when you're running well and when you're knocked off that by some external circumstance it, it feels different and you can develop a habit of checking like oh I'm I'm off my game today something something is perturbing it this normal state of health and that could inspire you or trigger you to get uh, conscious about what about naming it, about identifying it in its fullest form in a story, but it might be just start with an emotion, naming an emotion. Well, how am I feeling? And then looking for a cause or what am I doing and what's my purpose here? And the normal, so 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 recognizing how you feel normally, if if you're normally um, functioning well, thriving, feeling happy, then uh, the abnormal. And noticing when you shift out of that state, I guess being being aware, being uh, developing a habit of when you shift out of that state to take a step back, to shift from being subject to it. So if you're you're triggered um, and caught up in a subjective state, let's say of um, what might turn out to be inappropriate anger or guilt or uh, some other uh, emotion, stepping back. And making it objective, that's the, um, the subject-object switch that gives us power. That, that's our, uh, al allows us to disidentify with the subjective state and say, okay, th th this is an object I, of myself that I can be aware of, build a story around, evaluate it, change the story, and then step back into it and or, to, or to not live. change it. You don't necessarily it, have to change it just because you're angry or just because you're true, super yeah. happy. It could be a great. It could state. be good. Yeah, it could be. It could be a completely valid emotion if you're angry, for example, and you 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 you, you step back, understand why, and you go, yeah, this is uh, an appropriate reaction, an appropriate feeling, context. or in this context. But that um, move, that shift, being highly attuned to when you're knocked out of out of balance and then the ability to self repair which includes self-awareness being able to model represent yourself ultimately in a in a story and validate and like resolve contradictions and then come to accept some possibly modified story and be drawn back into it so you can experience yourself fully again that oscillation i think is a typical part of a happy person's life it's just and, and getting good at that is is an important element of virtue you could say I'll, I'll, i would caveat just i wouldn't call it knocked out of balance you know mm -hmm. when um when reardon gets super angry and slaps francisco uh, given his context of knowledge, given his value hierarchy, I think that's an appropriate reaction, his, his love for Dagny and so on. I wouldn't call that knocked out of balance. But it, would, it certainly would be a great opportunity to, you know, introspect and try and figure out, you know, he, he kind of loves Francisco and he certainly loves Dagny. Now, why is he so angry? Like, that would be a terrific opportunity, but I just wouldn't necessarily call it knocked out of balance. It would depend on... I, and I think I would differentiate between that sort of phenomenon and what goes around in PC campuses being called triggered. That has very little, if anything, to do with objective <laughs> emotional analysis. Oh, okay. Well, so l let me. So I, I heard a couple things. I want to I want to pull out and build on them. So first, I heard that the level of energy like joy anticipation aliveness that you're feeling right an orientation towards the world which is benevolent exciting creative like that the level of energy you feel that there that you often have you could say a typical level of that 
that is your normal comfort level, right? And that you can be more of that. Something really cool happens and your eyes open up and you get really excited. And so you can tell the difference or like too much is happening. You can't process it all. There's too many values going on. You don't know how to tell a story about it and you go down. So first of all, that there's this, uh, overgeneralized but useful concept we might call energy or aliveness mm-hmm. right and that it can be more or less and that you have an average in that and that when that shifts it tells you something important that's really useful information right uh-huh. right now if you go to anger again we can use reardon dealing with uh francisco and and dagny like him recognizing that Francisco is the man, mm. right? He's the guy. And, and in that moment, he's got these various stories going on, right? He loves Dagny. He loves Francisco. Mm-hmm. He protects his woman. He's competitive against the man who would take his woman or who touched his, like the owner, like all of these stories are going on. And in that moment, He feels anger enough to slap Francisco. Now, I think it's also really interesting to look at this same scene from Francisco's perspective using the same kind of analysis, but for Mm -hmm. sticking with Reardon, right? That in that moment, the various ideas and concerns and values, the various value stories that he's telling, the primacy of A over B in context D for purpose C, like for goal C, like all of these various stories come together and then he has an experience in that moment. Now, if we simplify it down into levels of energy or not energy, it's like he's in a, com- he's in a contracted place where he doesn't feel like he has a lot of choices. Mm-hmm. He's not the most creative Reardon he's ever been in that moment. Like he actually does something where he slaps someone he loves. But- Keep in mind that he also has, he's got conflicting models of Francisco. One is he's a really great person that he loves. And the other is he's this bum who's wrecking his business. Yes. So that clashing uh, identification of the nature of Francisco is a big, heavy part of this. Yes. Right before, right before this scene, he is told Francisco, hey, if you ever want a job, come work with me and I'll show you, I'll remind you what it's like to be a good guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so. Excellent. So another one of the stories that's in play is that uh, Francisco's a playboy who he despises. But the things play, uh, Francisco says are fantastic. Before this scene, he was in this conflict around Francisco. And then he's in conflict around Dagny and that she's had other lovers. And then it's him. Like all the stories come together. All of the constraints that those stories and values and virtues and standards represent or are... All, all of the constraints that are codified that have been put into terms as values, virtues, and, and standards, those stories, they're all coming together in this moment. And he has a phenomenological experience of what it's like to have all of those things happening at the same time. Right. right? That's what's happening. And in that, he makes a choice. Now, I will say that the phrase that I use to bring this all together is that emotions are messengers and motivators, right? Emotions are messengers and motivators. They tell you what's going on with your constraints. What's going on with your stories? Are your stories being frustrated or fulfilled, right? And the nature of the emotion depends on the kind of story and the kind of constraint that's being frustrated or fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So emotions are messengers. They give you a phenomenological readout of how the stories are playing out in your consciousness in that moment or in your subconscious. All these stories are playing out and your conscious experience is this phenomenological emotional state, Mm -hmm. right? That you're experiencing and you're naming ongoing. Mm -hmm. You might not even know that you're angry yet. All you know is you feel this feeling. You haven't named it as anger yet. So emotions are messengers Mm-hmm. in that they indicate their readouts, their, their symptoms of an underlying uh, psychodynamic process, and they are motivators. 
they give you the energy to do something about it. Your boundaries are in play and they give you a way, uh, the energy to do something about this boundary situation. So, so the underlying stories are in conflict with one another. Phenomenologically, you experience emotions in the face of that. The emotions are messengers and motivators. John, you said, ah, in this moment that you're having the emotion, that you're feeling the squirm, the anxiety, the happiness, that whatever it is, you're experiencing it subjectively. Like it's your emotion, you're experiencing it. But you can, if you learn to build the muscle, if you learn to use your mind in this particular capacity, you can notice the emotion that you're experiencing. You can observe the emotion as an emotion that you are experiencing rather than having it be, I'm feeling this. It's like, oh, I'm feeling this. Like you're still feeling it, but the more you can go, hmm, I'm really angry, yeah. right? To the degree that you can actually build a new self, a new subjective perspective to view your experience, you turn your subjective experience of anger into the object mm -hmm. of your experience. Mm -hmm. And you can tell essentially how well you've done it by how much of the emotion is part of your subjective. It's like, yeah, I'm really pissed off versus wow, I'm really pissed off. I'm curious mm -hmm. about that. And this is why curiosity of your own experience is one of the, the most powerful transformative things you can have because the more curious you get about what you're experiencing mm -hmm. the more you can build you could say a solid subject to view your experience as object mm -hmm. and really look at okay what are the message what is the message of this emotion yeah. and how do i want to use the energy to work with it yeah that's excellent i want to Add the conflict often happens during that moment when you could be curious about yourself. There's often a other emotion that I've experienced, which is sometimes shame or guilt or a meta anxiety, a, a, an anxiety about feeling your actual experience, feeling your feelings because they're wrong or bad somehow or reveal something bad about you. And so there can be a a resistance to looking and inner conflict even to make that shift that sometimes ke ke keeps us subject to this and we get more self-righteous about it and just dig in our heels when we want ideally to shift back and look and say and, and, and have the curiosity what's the cause of this and there's a uh, uh, something that helped me a metaphor that helped me make that shift is to imagine I'm in a dark room with a flashlight looking at something and I, and it may be something uh, nasty, a mess, a something dangerous or bad. And I'm identifying, I could either identify with um, the scary uh, part of me, let's say it's a, a snake on the, on the floor and I'm shining my flashlight on it. If I identify the snake as this negative part of me, um, I can I can I can be that, and there's resistance to that. And I can, but I can also identify with being the flashlight, and that shift helped me be okay with looking at the the snake or any anything I think might be a dangerous part of me to see. I'm identifying with this ability to step back and objectively observe what's in me without judgment initially, but active, but, but um, with the awareness that based on the primacy of existence, whatever it is, it's, it's there. It's not going to help not to see it. And you, you don't have to, uh, it, it's a, it's a, you could be friends with every part of you because it's actually part of you. And it's, it's it's necessary, even if it's some wrong part, that you're not going to get rid of it by avoiding it. Even if it's an undeveloped, bitter, resentful part. Yes, whatever. That that is 
that is in our best self ugly. Yeah. Right? Even if even if that's the case, since it's there, since, it's since it actually exists, right. you might as well treat it as if it exists, that it's part of the reality that you're dealing with. When yeah. I when I think when I think about Ayn Rand again, I, there's metaphysics, epistemology, uh, ethics, politics, aesthetics. It all comes down to metaphysics. Like what is existence exists be towards existence that that's the basis. That's the ground from which you work. I, I like to say that start from where you are, not from where you want to be or where you should be or where you could be or where you would be if only something had been different. Uh -huh. Right. I'm, in my emotional experience and I turn, I'm like experiencing this hatred, for example, or bitterness or resentment and self-righteousness, right? And I see it, I, my flashlight in, in my consciousness, I experience it and I go, oh, that's ugly. I don't want that to be true. Therefore, I'm gonna pretend that it's not true. No, 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 that's not good. That is, right. that is the fundamental mistake. That's the thing that I got from Ayn Rand. Like right. when I really look at the main thing, like it's like, no, embrace reality. Reality is where all of the action and all of the traction is. Reality oh. <laughs> is your friend. Reality <laughs> is the basis from which you move. So yeah. just to summarize what John was saying, we actually came up with a slogan for this oh, cool. Project a couple of decades ago and the slogan is be the flashlight not what the flashlight is shining on mm -hmm. so you're you're linking your better self to this process of examining something negative about yourself or that it's and, not the best part of the best within you about yourself and, that you're trying to get rid of ideally and and no matter what you're looking at or how bad it is you can take pride in that you're the flashlight looking at it. You're examining it right now. Right. Your willingness to see it as mm -hmm. it is, to admit it as it is, to actually look at your shadow, uh -huh. the part of you that you wish wasn't true, your willingness to look at it is where the power is. That's okay. where the glory is. That's where the heroism is. That's what you can feel pride for. Yeah. And right? It, it, and again, if we, if we oh. go into this ego as organism process uh -huh. and that it's a series of narratives that we're building and that when we face our contradictions, when we face our internal conflicts of values, we can use that conflict to shine the flashlight on it and understand the underlying values to say, yes, I do want to honor my contracts, but I also want to enter into contracts that are good. Benevolent. And and benevolent. And if I misunderstood a contract, that's important versus just following the contract, right? I've got this contradiction. So then I come to a higher level understanding. That higher level understanding is a transcendence of self. It's I now have a more complex, more powerful, more integrated self. Mm -hmm. I say that over time, that integration, if you're growing, just keeps happening and keeps happening. And there's no limit to how complex and integrated you get and it's always unfinished yeah it's always unfinished so in that in that i like to say that right now no matter how good you are or how bad you are you suck compared to how you can be you suck compared to how you're going to be a year from now, five years from now, if you actually be the flashlight and you do the work and you do the integrations. You suck compared to how you, and five years from now, no matter how good you are, you suck compared to how you're going to be five years after that, right? In reality, you always suck. You are always in a state of what I call infinite failure compared to how you could be compared to how you will be once you actually face yourself, once you actually turn the spotlight on yourself and accept the reality of who you are, warts and all, uh -huh. irrationalities and all, uh -huh. right? Social metaphysics and all, like clashing take every values. resentment uh -huh. and, uh -huh. what? Uh, clashing values, unclear value. Harmony. Yes, 
all of that is true. You are in, a, in an incomplete state of nature, right? Nature is incomplete. It is transcending itself to honor Mr. Deacon for a moment, yeah, yeah. right? It's, we are always in a state of incomplete nature. Uh -huh. the, it is not resting on your laurels. It's not, oh, here's what I've done up till now that determines, like, am I being a moral, heroic being? Like, this, this show is called Being an Ayn Rand Hero. The heroic move is always, okay, right here, right now, it is the way that it is. <laughs> right? It's over. The past is over. It's done. Like, it can't... It, the world is the way that it is. I am the way that I am completely. I, I sometimes say that I can't be any more the way that I am than I already am. Right? Like I am perfectly the way that I am right now. I can't become more like I am right now. I can become like something else. But right now I am perfect the way that I am. And if I can accept that, then I never have to defend about the fact that I've got some ugliness in there. Uh -huh. I never have to, because that's just how it is. The heroic move is to be the flashlight and to accept yourself exactly how it is. To be towards reality intransigently, uh -huh. that it is the way that it is. And by working with it the way that it is, by working with myself the way that I am, not making it wrong, learning from it, improving it, resolving the contradictions, like putting yep. the flashlight on my experience, recognizing what I'm feeling and then why I'm feeling it and what there is to learn from that so that I can integrate the contradictions at a higher level. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a little tension there in what you're saying. I get the, I get the spirit of it and agree, but if we, if we don't have it say, if we don't accept that, X pursuit, the pursuit of X value is not as good for uh, our happiness as pursuit of Y value, a different value, then, um, then we won't pursue it. So we, there needs to be that pressure of saying, um, this is not as good for us or bad for us um, on the demand, on the, along the continuum and goal of trying to achieve happiness. And that's the motivation, the impetus to drop, uh, let's say, one standard virtue or value, which is constraining ourselves, and evolve into accepting a different one. So, I, 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 I agree absolutely. It brings up a very important question, which is that the word good has two major meanings. Right. On the one hand, there is, in terms of the psychological organism, Good is that which leads to more complexity, more depth, more aliveness, more life, a greater capacity to maintain myself, to replicate myself and transcend myself. Uh, and experience and enjoy uh, and, and, a and, character we've achieved. That's, half, that's a state of happiness, all of that together. Yes. The, there's a distinction I make between joy and happiness when there's joy is part can be part of happiness but so can sadness happiness is the experience of a well-functioning or thriving self thriving uh, symbolic organism that we are when that thrives um sometimes it, you're sad it you Work could be sad quarry. your your loved one dies and you're sad that's th that's part of thriving too joy when you achieve your value sadness when you lose doesn't necessarily mean it's your fault but I wanted to make a, or clarify a distinction between joy and happiness. Sometimes they're often equ equated. So, 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 yes, yeah, so yes, yes, yes. There's a couple distinctions I use to make sense of this. Um, one is that you could say the existing constraints, the stories that you have, are the way that they are. Right. And when confronted with different situations, you tell the stories that you've habitually told and you experience what your experience Roar, uh, reared in, in that moment, felt anger towards Francisco and slapped him. That was the reality of where he was. All of his stories came together in reality. OK, then 
he made sense of that. Like he looked at all of that and he went, oh, I'm going to attack the man. Now his story, like the, the goal that he was working towards in that moment was very short-sighted. He was not taking into account, no, where do I want to be five years from now, 10 years from now? What are the values that are, it, it all got coalesced because his situation was so tight. His, you could say his prosperity, the realm of what he was actually inheriting in that moment was so conflicted that he had very little purpose. So there's like the set of stories as they exist in any moment that are um, represented through constraints on a biological, physical level. The stories that we tell about that, how we understand that and how they all fit together into a, a psychological story. And then there's the experience, the phenomenological experience of that. And I, I, I differentiate these three realms that are going on in any moment. There's the reality, there's how we're understanding it and how we feel, right? I call it prosperity, purpose, and pleasure, these three realms. So yes, when our stories are aligned and we're headed towards someplace that we experience as beautiful and transcendent and growing and better, towards the actual health of the organism, then we feel happy, even if what's happening is completely disappointing or sad or even tragic, right? There, like, I, I think about, I think about the death of my mom and the, the, her dying and being able to be by her bedside. Like there, there was a moment like she, she, her lungs were filling with fluid and she couldn't breathe. She was fighting for breath, just fighting for breath. And I'm holding her hand and looking in her eyes. And I recognize in that moment, I cannot breathe for her. Like, and that moment was one of the most painful in my life, but also one of the most beautiful and deep and profound because like in the face of all of that, I was just with her, loving her. And she was looking at me and I was looking at her and the connection we were having took all of that into account. And in that moment, I felt alive, right? That, that's the phenomenological experience of integrating those stories, right? So happiness in the way that you're describing it is the the state of aliveness from everything coming together well well yeah com uh, coming together well and so so let's call that good i want to call that good and i want to say that's what goodness truly is goodness I mean, is anything that moves in that direction is good and the ultimate good is as far out that direction as you can go so that's good bad is that which moves you away from that and the absolute worse is the absolute dissolution of that. So there's better and worse, good and bad. Now that's one use of the word good. Okay. So that's one use of the word good. Now there's another use of the word good, which is not about the process of moving towards more and more states of of maintenance, transcendence and replication, like the psychological self growing right? That there is not the actual lived experience, the, the choice in the moment to be the flashlight and to, and to grow, but there is good in terms of, you could say a religious or dogmatic morality. And it can be any kind of morality, which is dogmatic. I have met objectivists who, instead of being on the path of morality and rationality as the virtue of discovering ever deeper levels of what's possible have like, no, we've got a rule and you're either following the rule or you're not following the rule. And if you follow the rule, you're good. And if you don't follow the rule, you're bad. And that's a different kind of good and bad. It might, it might be associated with this transcendence good, this actual psychological health good, but it could be something else. It's 
am I, I'm actually judging what has happened and saying, does it match the standard or not? And what that means in terms of myself, like that's again, make to make this personal or to bring it back to Reardon. I experience resentment and self-righteousness. And it's right there in my consciousness. It's real and it's ugly. Like in terms of goodness and badness, it is headed that way. The more I give in to that resentment and self-righteousness, the more I'm going to deconstruct and deteriorate myself. Right? Because I'm letting this thing override my other constraints, my other values. This value is dominating my other values. And it's not good. And I see it. Now, in that moment, noticing that is good in the sense of actual growth. But if I look at that and say, I'm a bad person, that's like a, that's not about this. This is like, I'm, I'm not talking about actual growth and development. I'm talking about my person and is my person good or bad? And I call that the realm of shame. Like, is my person good or bad? Am I worthy of love? Am I worthy of respect? You know, uh, Nathaniel Brandon says self-esteem is two things or, or Galt says self-esteem is two things, you know, take your pick, right? It, it's that you are capable of living and that you are worthy of happiness, right? And I take fundamental issue with this because I think it's all about, am I capable and how much more capable can I become? Because I'm always in a state of incomplete nature. I'm always, I'm always broken. So recognizing my resentment as part of me right now that I can do something about is good. But saying that I'm a bad person because of it, or I notice great thoughts and I say, I'm a good person. It's like, it's a whole different dimension. There's, is it good? Does it lead to a better life? Or am I good? Right. One is about my behavior and capabilities. The other is about my person. Which is a legitimate, I, there's, I want, I want to disavow a notion that I'm sensing, which is that we don't have an essential nature at any given point in time. I think we do. I think, I think it's a firm fixed nature. That doesn't mean we're stuck in it. We can change it. So I, I'm not sure exactly if that whole concept of incomplete nature, I mean, until we die, we're always evolving and getting more values and we can always improve or devolve. Either way, we can get worse. But, um, but nonetheless, at any given moment, like everything in reality, we have an essential identity. So I don't want to go against identity. Yes. There. And the yes. other thing I wanted to say is that resentment could be a legitimate uh, affect, moral affect. It could, and, and also, um, you also talked about um, uh, experiencing um, righteousness. And I think that could be a legitimate moral affect in a context to some person, sometime. I'm not arguing about how you are experiencing yours, but I just don't want to blanketly say resentment and righteousness are always negative or anti happiness. Okay, go ahead, John. Okay. Thank you. Um, one. So, so Mark, you had brought up this uh, distinction between being worthy of happiness and, or let, let me put a little, put my distinction on it. The distinction between being worthy of happiness and being able to be happy. I don't make a distinction between those two. And I think that's part of what you were bringing up. And I'm not sure this was that Rand made this clear or that she would even agree with this. But I had a problem early on from my understanding of Rand thinking that there was something extra I needed to do besides being capable of being happy in order to be worthy of it. 
And there was a shift that happened when I got rid of that distinction in part and in, in, in concluded that however happy I am, I'm worthy of that. And however capable I am of happiness, I'm worth being that happy. There is no extra thing that I got to do to earn whatever happiness I'm capable of. That I, there's no cheating when there's no metaphysical possibility of cheating on virtue and getting happy. There's no way to get around this when you see the self as an organism who's thriving is the cause of the experience of happiness. You have to thrive to be happy. And if you and and virtue is the activity of thriving. So you need to be virtuous in order to be happy. This distinction is not so clear if you view humans as biological organisms and that life long range or doing things that keep that life going is the cause of happiness. You could imagine evil people who are long lived and hap and and uh, healthy biologically, and but my contention, or even rational, like an evil genius, like Tui, an old evil genius like Tui. I think such people are possible, but they're not happy. I don't. Uh, that that's where I would draw the line. I would say it's possible for that kind of person to be happy. Uh, so so I'll I I will accept exactly what you're saying, and I like how you say, "Look, I am worth whatever happiness I have. I'm worthy of that." Now, how could you be unworthy of it? Right in 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 the way you're saying, it's like no. Two plus two is four. If you have a certain level of thriving, you're going to experience a certain kind of happiness. If your stories are in sync to a degree, you're going to feel that kind of happiness because they're concomitant. They're, they're two, different, two different dimensions of the same thing. And, and to me, what that says is the idea of worthiness becomes a non- useful issue. Occam's razor, you can just drop whether or not you're worthy. Because the truth is, you are as happy as you're happy based on your integration, based on your thriving. Mm -hmm. And your commitment to it. We, we disagree with this aspect of Rand um, and think that it's legitimate. And she even has quotes where she says, so it's, we should make happiness our ultimate end. We re firmly believe that the first step into ethics is is making happiness your ultimate end. So you do that, and then you, you know, there's a number of other things mm -hmm. to do after well, that, but that's the first step. Yeah, well, well if if what, what John is saying is accurate, which I, I agree with, which is that happiness is the phenomenological experience of thriving in this, in this, like how we're defining the terms. It's that it is the concomitant of how your stories are coming together, how your constraints are playing out. Value hierarchy. Your yeah. value hierarchies. Oh, value yes. hierarchy. It includes yes. values. Absolutely. The, the value hierarchies as represented in stories as they're playing out in consciousness. Yes. But if your ultimate end were to, let's say, gain power, gain control of, over others, no matter how it affected the way you feel, how, how it affected your own happiness. You end up with wine and Tui. Perfect yeah. examples. Tui, yeah. I never expected to be happy. It was never my goal to be happy. Exactly. Wine and so It's important, even if people do it implicitly, I don't mean to say that it has to be conscious, but you do, in some terms, have to set the course uh, ethically speaking, of achieving happiness as your ultimate end, and and it can be an implicit process, but but that's where you have to be headed and, in order for this all to to build it, up. To this yes, thing. to choose happiness as your ultimate end is good, in the sense of capacity, in the sense of psychological growth, in the sense of the ego as organism becoming its fulfillment of itself tapping into the potentials of happy to choose that is good it's the I'm beginning gonna, of good 
It's I'm gonna the first step on good. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with that. As with but Prashant said that it's a first step towards building up a concept of the moral good. Yeah, moral good. An objective egoistic moral value needs to be built up. Prior to building that, you need to choose your purpose of, and in this case, like Rand did, we're choosing happiness. But there is no need to validate that choice. And it doesn't make it subjective. In other words, it doesn't make it subjective in a bad way. You could say, oh, it's a subjective choice because you're choosing it. But it doesn't make um, that choice, there's no, alt there's no objective alternative when you're choosing an ultimate end. It sets the standard for everything the, else to you, where you can you, get into that ob trichotomy. Objectivity comes in as with the standard of how you're going to get there. Once you choose happiness as your ultimate end, now you could ask yourself, by what standard should I be guided? Which well, so 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 I, I'd like I'd like to agree with everything you said and add a complication, which is exponential and recursive. <laughs> right? Which is you can only choose to pursue happiness at the level at which you currently understand happiness. And so as you develop, you recursively improve your idea of happiness, right? And again, I will say that that path, if you're on that path, that's the good, that's the heroic choice. That is, and at every point on the journey, you always suck compared to how you could be. You're always in a state of failure compared to how you will be as you continue on. Your current understanding of happiness is impoverished or compared you, to how it's going to be. Wait, you could look at it the other way, glass half, half full. You could say, without your current level of understanding, you couldn't possibly get to that next level. So it's really good where you're at. You're not sucking, you're terrific. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Right. And, and this, this is where, this is how I solve the problem of worth. Exactly what Bashan just said. It's like, okay, wait a minute. It is the case that you're ultimately failing all the time. You're always in a state of infinite failure, period, end of story, no getting away from that. But that also means that you're in a state of infinite becoming and that everything that you have achieved to this point is exactly what you need in order to get going. You are perfect exactly as you are, as, as screwed up as that is compared to how good you could be, you are perfectly yourself. Therefore, you are worthy by definition. You are worthy by definition. If, if you're going to consider worth at all, you're worthy. Now, the reason I say this is that in my experience, in my coaching practice, mm -hmm. in my study of value systems across time, religious value systems, philosophical value systems, this idea of worth is the central spiritual challenge of human beings, is that we try to be worthy. And therefore, when we look into our own consciousness and we see ugly resentment and resignation, and self-righteousness, not the good kind of righteousness, not the like, this is right, I will stand for it. Like right now, I would say I'm being righteous in my tone, but I'm not being self-righteous in my tone about the, like that, the difference there, like this self-righteousness, I have that. And when I see it, I can recognize it as ugly, but not need to hide from it or to pretend like it's not there. I can own my shadow because I recognize that worth isn't a real game. It's a mistake. You know, I'm, this is a great point you're bringing up and especially in religious systems, the self is not an end in itself in all the religious systems. You need to justify your existence by virtue of your sacrifices to the system or to the priest or to the God or whomever. And in that sense, yeah, I think we should just get rid of the idea of worth. And that, and that has been the bane of humanity. That is true. We are ends in ourselves. And as Rand says it in Anthem, my happiness needs no justification, right? But they approach human beings as your existence needs a justification. It's very platonic. You are a cell on the body of the state and your existence has to support the state and the priests who run the state. 
So, or preachers or, 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 or rabbis or whoever. So yeah, in that sense, that has been a horrible bane to humanity. And in that sense of righteousness or in that sense of um, worthiness or worth, it's a problem. Um, but I don't usually look at worth from that perspective. So, but I get what you're looking at. I yeah. So, so in, in my experience, when I'm dealing with my, when I'm dealing with my clients, when I'm dealing with myself, <laughs> when I'm dealing with my friends, the thing that I always see getting in the way is people don't want to look at the reality of what they actually think, what they actually feel, what they actually want, what they're really experiencing. They feel uncomfortable looking at it because if they really looked at it, they would see that parts of it are ugly. And so instead of becoming the flashlight, what they do is they turn the flashlight away from that. Oh my gosh, I don't want to see that. I don't want to face that. I don't want to confront that in myself. And it's that unwillingness to confront the truth of who you are that cripples your ability to grow. Because what you want to do is you want to use your emotions to bring your, your conflicts into consciousness so that you can resolve them and create the higher level story so you can transcend yourself. I look at Atlas Shrugged. I look at how many times in, in Ayn Rand's stories, her heroes make a mistake that Ayn Rand labels as a mistake. She implicitly labels as a mistake. Her characters say something along these lines. I know I should really figure this out. There's something important here that I need to figure out. There's the principle of the Dean and I have not figured this out. And until I figure it, but I don't have time to figure it out. I can't do it. So I'm just going to push that off. Right. That that like unwillingness to look at the fire Right. And when you look at John Galt, that's John Galt is the man without shame. He is willing to look at everything from the flashlight perspective and really shine a line on it and take it apart and create consistent stories. Mm. He he is the man without contradiction. You know, like, and, and that's why Rand says happiness is a non-contradictory joy. It's a joy without contradiction. Now, I personally don't think that that's in the cards for human beings. I think that human beings get better and better and better and better and better. And no matter how much better you get, there's infinity further to go because there's no limit to the amount of things that I can learn and integrate. And Well, the, the limit is death. Okay, there's that limit. How sure. But, in, but in, yeah, so, the question is, what can you accomplish in a lifetime? We don't know yet. Yeah, that's, so can, that's potentially. Go ahead. So there's, uh, yeah, if you, I'm, I'm, I have a mental checklist of three things I think I want to go to for it. And the most the most important one that I want to come back to is linking the phenomenological experience that we've been talking about with the theory of self as organism. So explicitly say when, what, what kind, what are the major ways that we can, our organism can malfunction, say, let's say, and what's the phenomenological experience of that malfunction? And then what's the way we can function well and what's, how does it feel to do that? And there's, Four things that I identified, and you might want to add more. But one is sorrow, guilt, anxiety, um, depression, as ways we can uh, lack health. That the organism, or um, the joy, pride. Um, uh, instead of sorrow, joy, instead of guilt, pride, instead of depression, uh, a feeling of energy, energy, lots of energy delight. and anxiety versus uh, maybe peace, calm, integration. So that's one thing that uh, I want to do. And since it's the most important, maybe I should just jump into it right now. Is that OK? So I think the feeling of anxiety is when 
is the existential feeling of when there's standards that are conflicting. You have the primacy of A over B and the primacy of B over A, like Ayn Rand's squirms. Um, it feels anxious. And when there's alignment, when the conflict is resolved, you can feel relaxed, um, at ease, at peace, in harmony with yourself. For example, that's one dimension. Um, uh, de de depression, for example, I, my suspicion is that the feeling of depression is a feeling of low, it's an experience of low energy, where energy is the standards that you have installed in yourself combined with your expectation or belief that your act, your virtue, what's under your control, your the actions that you can take to satisfy your standards are going to be efficacious and actually pay off, be worth the effort. And, so when, and, if, and if you don't think that they're going to be worth the effort, right. you become hopeless and that leads to depression. Yeah, yes. So, so your depression is, is, is a complex, to, uh, perhaps total state of the the organism where, uh, it and and it could be uh, where you're not you don't have this uh, conviction that effort is going to pay off and provide enough value that make the effort worthwhile, and it could be in each each of these uh, um, states could be a state that's uh, represent a well-functioning self or not. So even depression, if you were in a prison, in a concentration camp and your values were being threatened and everything you had being taken away and your freedom and your family and your money and your career and everything was just ripped from you, it could be very uh, well-functioning to feel depressed because you can't get your values now. You had certain standards that are not able to, you're not able to satisfy. You have desires that, value. Um, the value, well, standards that give rise to desires. Values. And from those, you, you integrate those into values that you're, that you maybe used to act for and now you can't. And so you feel depressed. Mm -hmm. and if you, so so let, let me build on that for a moment because, um, this, there, I mean, there's just so much richness in this. Thank you, guys. Fantastic conversation. So one of the things that happens is that I have a whole series of goals that I want to achieve in a, a whole bunch of realms. Now, if I decide that I am unable to get one of those goals in the way that we're talking, like that, that the effort and the knowledge that I have and the capacities that I have and the opportunities that I see, I can't find a way of exerting effort and creativity and work. I can't imagine a way to make that happen. Or I've tried all the ways that I can think of and they've all failed. And I have exhausted my possibilities to achieve that goal. That, that there's no more effort that I can make that I think is worth the effort. Right? In that realm, I'll experience, you could say, a bit of hopelessness, right? And that I'm, and I'm going to essentially give up in that realm. Now, if I have another realm in which I can absolutely kick ass, in which the work I'm doing is growing and growing and growing, right? Then I'll just shift my attention there and build that. And I won't get depressed in the, in the, situation of the concentration camp. I've been reading Gulag Archipelago and I've been very influenced by Jordan Peterson around this and Viktor Frankl that, okay, so you're in this concentration camp and all of the normal goals that you would pursue, they're dead ends. There's like, you, you can't. So then the question becomes, can you find goals that you can make progress on, that you can develop yourself on, that give you enough of that energy to stave off the depression. And this is exactly the question that the concentration camp 
uh, survivors had to deal with or the ones who died. When you're, when you're a concentration camp victim, if you can't find some realm in which you can tell stories of self-transcendence, if you can't do that, then you get depressed and die. And the survivors, like what everyone, what the people who have told the thing is that they found goals towards which they felt that they could make progress. And they put all of their heart and soul into that goal. And that's how they avoided depression. So I think it's, it's a way of taking what you're saying and expanding it. So. Yep, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Cause even they show that even in a concentration camp, some people are able to make meaning and that's part of the essence of what the self requires. Have values, pursue values. Consciousness uh, is yes. a position. And values need to be meaningful. What that means when you say it's meaningful is that it relates to some standards of the self, is selected according to some standards of yourself that are in you, in your and, ego. And and positive meaning because no. because the, uh, it, those standards. Yeah. Again, in in the model that you're laying out for depression, like I have a goal that I want to achieve. Let's say, let's say that I, let's say that I want to have children and I want to have a family Uh and I have been separated from my wife and my children. Uh Okay. That's a story. And that story has meaning and the meaning sucks, right? There Uh is meaning there. The meaning is I have lost that. It is gone. They might be dead. My Uh life in that sense is over. There's Mm -hmm. lots of meaning and it all sucks. Mm -hmm. Meaning for positive meaning, the kind of meaning that actually fuels the organism rather than destroying the organism, Mm -hmm. right? In terms of this, if we're saying depression versus aliveness or Mm -hmm. depression versus effervescence, Mm -hmm. it's the kind of meaning that leads towards effervescence is the story gets more beautiful. I can take action. I can add work. I can effort and the story gets beautiful. The change in the story is where the meaning is. It can get better or it can get worse. If it gets worse, it leads toward depression. If it gets better, it leads towards uh, thing. So meaning, unless you can find a way of making the thing you're experiencing positively meaningful. Yeah. Satisfying the standards that are within the best within you. That's what positively meaningful means yeah which means you've got some standards in there that you've validated or um are objective because you could and and i will say relatively objective given that we're in a state of infinite failure like we can (laughs) we can always get better i wouldn't say infinite failure but we, we are in a very 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 early stages of development of ethics yes yes absolutely and so they get relatively validated yeah. And uh, example of a invalid value, invalid standard is trying to, um, uh, it would be something that's impossible. Holding yourself to a standard of perfection, like uh, God, like omniscience, never make a mistake, always have the right answer to hold that as a standard and then beat yourself up because, oh, I made a mistake. I didn't know something. I was wrong. That's an example of it. Invalid Invalid. standard. Not the best within you. And and, and, and I'll say this brings back, this brings back the difference between good and good. Yeah. Right. Right. Like, because the truth is, the truth is you made a mistake relative to, to omniscience. Right. The truth is that you that you set a goal of how much physical effort you were going to put in and then you fell asleep, right? You failed, but do you beat yourself up for it? It depends. Or do yeah. you or do you just recognize that and learn from it? It depends. Sometimes you fall if it's a predictable failure where you're slacking off or you know just being sloppy and there was no good reason for that, then yeah, you might beat yourself up about that. If it's an omniscient standard where you really didn't know, but you tried your best, then no, you shouldn't beat yourself up about but, that. Oh, but, okay, so I want, I want to hit this. I want to hit this really hard. What does it mean to try your best? 
I have never in my life tried my best. I always try my best. So let's fight about this, Mark. Okay, okay great, great. So let's let's look at this because I can think of today. When I woke up this morning, I did not wake up as cleanly as I wanted to wake up. Mm. Right? Like I had an intention this morning when I was going to get up, I was going to get up and I was going to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Now, like in a sense, I won because I did all the things that I said I was going to do. Mm. Except the way that I did them, I did not have the level of energy that I wanted. Mm -hmm. I did not have the clarity. I did not have the crispness, the joy. Mm -hmm. I did good, but I didn't do as good as I wanted. Now, could I have done better? Yes. Yes, I could have done better. Right. Did I do my best? Yes. Well, given how I was feeling this morning, given how I slept last night, given the food, given my, you know, the little bit of a cold that I have, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Like, did I do my best? Uh, you know, Sartre gave a great example about this. Where, where he said, okay, so let's say you're going to get tortured by the Nazis to give up your friends in the resistance. Mm -hmm. And you get into the torture room and the, and the Nazi looks at you and he says, okay, so we're going to get the information. Do you see all these tools? You are going to break. You might break in five minutes. You might break in five hours. You might break in five days. But we're going to win. Now, Sartre says, he's right. <laughs> he is right. You will not be able to deal with all of the pain and suffering. You will give up. The question is, how soon do you give up? And how soon should you give up? Do you just give up right away? Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. No, you have to at least go through some of the pain, but how much pain? What's your best in that? So, so anyway, great. You want to argue? I, I say, what do you say? <laughs> um, well, in that particular case, I would just give them the information immediately. I wouldn't even go through one minute of torture. That would be my personal best. But, um, nice. uh, Me too. but, but in a more normal context, um, no, I think those factors you brought up, Mark, are definitely contributing to context C or, or D, whichever it was, you know, yes. the primacy of value A over value B in context C to achieve overall value D. So yeah, that you have a cold, that you didn't sleep well, those all have to be factored into what was possible. Because when we talk about the best within you or doing your best, et cetera, it's not, again, some sort of godlike omniscient standard. So you have to be, you have to kind of, it's sort of like an athlete. You know, if you've run the track and your time is, you know, five minutes to get around a certain track, if that's your normal average time, and today you did seven minutes, well, but this time you didn't have shoes. Okay, so that's going to affect it. So you have to factor in all those things to understanding the context and how well you performed. Ag ag agreed. I have a point. Agreed. A relevant point to make here okay. about the best. And it's really, we should only want the best of happiness. We should never act for the best of anything less than happiness. In other words, mm -hmm. you shouldn't try to maximize your energy when you get up in the morning as like, that's the most important thing in life. And I'm going to try to do my best at that because whatever energy you spend at that, you're not going to have to spend at something else. Whatever attention you give to that is not going to be attending to other things. And there's a cost benefit trade-off. The ultimate sum of all those cost benefit trade-offs in our life is our state of thriving, flourishing, our experience of happiness. So if, if you want to maximize something, maximize your happiness. There's no uh, other lesser value that you can safely maximize if you get it's my drift, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, so so to to say thing, a, get thing, there. a thing about that. So so my work in the game of thriving, I say that thriving consists of three things: prosperity, like what you wake up in the morning, like your wealth and your health and your infrastructure and your relationships, like the stuff of your life, and then purpose, the stories you tell about it. Like, how do you understand it? How beautiful is it? How inspiring is it? How enlivening is it? How joyful is it? Like, 
the the four things that you're talking about and then pleasure like what's the actual experience like and you need to optimize for all three of those you can't just optimize for one of them because they're all connected right so it's a multivariate situation if you're going to go for happiness in the way you're describing it it includes everything it includes every variable possible yeah, that's, Brett Wines, that's so complex. And yes. they can oscillate. Like and sometimes, oscillate and change. Uh, yeah, and... oscillate and change depending upon how... Marginal that... utility. There's a marginal utility going on. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. <laughs> yes. And that's what makes it that, that's what makes it fun and worthwhile. And that's why I call it the game of thriving. It's like, why do you do it? Do you do it in order to be a good person? No, because we're not trying to be a good person. We're doing it for better because it's just better. You do it like a game person mm-hmm. a happy person yeah so 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 i agree maximizing for happiness that's what you want to maximize for and the way that you understand happiness right now sucks compared to how much you're going to understand happiness in five years yeah <laughs> We're going to be happier next time. And, and a, at the same time, it's the best you've ever been because it's the best you've ever understood. There's a glass happiness. half full. <laughs> well, so ho- hopefully, like you said, you know, at any one time, your state can get better. Yeah. So in, 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 in terms of the best, the question becomes, when is it ever your best choice to beat yourself up about something? Now, I actually have an answer for that. And that's when that's the best you got, <laughs> right? Like, well, like, you like. Always want to review the tapes after the football game and do a post game analysis. I think in general that when the big value, that's abs- a good idea. A- absolutely, but when do you beat up the players and when do you point out what they didn't do well and encourage them to do better? Well, like some- when when do you beat up on them? When is that the best choice? Beating up on yourself would be where you in a context where you knew what you did was wrong or not helpful or not moving you towards happiness and you knew it at the time so it's not like an what Rand calls a breach i of- knew at the time that i could i knew at the time that i could be happier than i was this morning i knew it i was watching myself do it and i was going no 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 dude bro. you're really you're really not bringing the best attitude to this is not the same thing as saying like uh i was really gruff to a person recently and I, I don't usually do that in, in a way where it's like, oh, like as it's coming out of my mouth, I'm like, oh, this is not what I wanted. This is not what I intended. And I came back to the person and I said, hey, I was really blunt there. And I'm, I apologize. I meant to say that thing, which is the truth. But, but, I that, but, but, I meant but isn't, better- okay, okay. So, so, so again, I'm, so for you to repair the damage that you did to the relationship because you value the relationship. Because it supports my happiness. Because it supports your happiness. That's good. It is good. Mm-hmm. But why beat yourself up? Because just, if I didn't go- acknowledge the problem, then I'm a Pollyanna sticking ostrich sticking my head in the sand saying everything I do is perfect. Yes. I want to be sensitive to am I really meeting up to my standards or not? Well, uh, yeah. Go, John. This brings up, up. The- so much fun. It yeah. is. <laughs> and, and we're approaching the bottom of the hour when I need to go. But this this issue of guilt unearned guilt versus re- earned guilt is maybe we could bring it go into more depth next time but this is a this is a another experience that tells you you know when you're feeling guilty there's an opportunity to step back from it to make the objective perspective to be the flashlight to look at it ultimately you could put it in into story form and see uh, how objective is it how objective is this how can an objective is this guilt can I explain it to somebody else that's in an objective way so that they can understand and say, it oh, I, I can see why you feel guilty about or that. Or unearned guilt. Is it pay attention to, uh, is, it, is it based in reality? Is it contradictory in some way? Are you are the standards that you have, the platonic ideal intrinsic standards that are impossible to meet? Or is it reality-based standards based on your human nature? Or your abilities? own validation of your own personal standards, not just right. universe. Yes. Yeah. There's that's for objectivity of each of these things that maybe that's another topic, but yeah. there's yeah. yeah. So, so by by the way, just so you know, I wrote a book called "The Key Is in the Darkness: Unlocking the Door to a Spiritual Life." Mm, nice. And it's all about what is the difference between, like, being the flashlight, looking mm-hmm. at what it is that you want to learn, 
refining the judgments and the discernment that you want to use about what is what is better, what is worse, and continually refining yourself to do better and better and better. And mm-hmm. to be willing to look at everything that you're doing that's less than optimal so that you can do better at it. Mm-hmm. Versus saying, and therefore I'm a bad person and I need to hide it because I don't want to, I don't want to be a bad person. I don't want to be a bad person. I don't want to be a bad person. So I call that guilt and shame. Guilt is what can I learn from it? Mm -hmm. Shame is what's wrong with me. It it could similar questions, similar questions, but completely different worlds. Anyway, so I wrote a book about that. So I I would love to talk about it more. I don't want to get too far distracted in it. Um, and what is the, and I, I just want to close with what's the uh, outcome, what happens after you take each approach? Do you, do you try more? Are you more motivated or do you want to give up? So one might be this, so, uh, you know, sort of an excuse to give up and not try. And that, you know, kind of gives you the clue. It's to the avoid wrong. reality. Don't yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> Or, you know, we, I think we should also bring in the whole issue of um, sense of life and malevolence versus benevolence because um, not not necessarily today, but that's sort of like a leitmotif or a hallmark that runs through people in terms of how hard do they try, how much validation do they do and so on. And a benevolent person will de- tend to do a whole lot more of that because they've had the experience early in early childhood. It pay off, pays off. It paid off for them in early childhood. So as they go through adulthood, they do more. And a lot of people, in my experience, are very benevolent when it simply comes to their work on their own and reality. They're highly benevolent. You think of all these scientists here in Silicon Valley or whatever. But a ton of people are very malevolent socially because they had traumatic childhoods. And then their experience was that they were not efficacious at getting the values and standards that they needed met um, by exercising their virtues. And so they had a lot of frustration or trauma as children, and they grew up being malevolent. And it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, a a feedback loop that ends in um, uh, bad relationships as they go into the future. Absolutely. As as a suggestion, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Me too, Mark. So this conversation has really been about what do I do when I have values conflicts within myself? Mm -hmm. How do I... Like take these values, conflicts, and use the conflict, use the emotions as an opportunity to find the message, to use the motivation to actually do the flashlight work and find the that, higher level synthesis that allows me to reconcile these conflicting values, to tell a higher, deeper, more meaningful story. Validate that, to get to happiness. Objects yes. be for happiness. And this yes. is a story too. They're the and, form in which we resolve these conflicts. Yes. And, and everything that we've said has been towards that. It would be interesting perhaps in our next conversation to see how does this play out between two people or between groups, right? When two different people have different stories, mm-hmm. how can we use this exact same logic in order to build a relationship mm-hmm. in the same way that we build ourselves? Yeah. Just like, yeah, obviously, yeah. obviously this is like my thriving partnerships work is all about this. I'm all, I love this conversation. So yes, Prashan, yes, let's get into benevolence, benevolence, malevolence with others as well. It's like um, our underlying sort of light motif of a story that we're telling about the world. Rand says that sense of life is what do you think of others? What do you think of yourself? What do you think of reality qua reality? And those answers to those questions set up pretty much everything else we're going to do. So I liked her, uh, some of her work on that a lot. Amen. But yeah, I guess we have to draw this, draw a line and draw this to an end. And it's been terrific, Mark, as always. Yeah. Thank you. So John Yukella, Rashawn Martin, thank you. May this be the beginning of many conversations. Yeah. I appreciate your time. I appreciate the, the intelligence and the caring that you bring to us. Thank you, Mario. Okay. Rock on. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye.